So today we are happy to have virtually uh, Zuhar Komargotsky from Simon Center Stony Brook and he's going to tell us about giant vortices and the resin. Over to you Zuhar. Thank you very much. Again, apologies, I couldn't make it. I do hope to come in person in the near future. Um, so this topic is based um, this talk is based on a paper from a, that's actually posted to the archive uh, today. There's lots of background noise. Is there something I can do about it? Sound is a little funny, yeah. Um, doesn't sound like he's on volume or something. There is a, a second, Zohar. Yes. Okay. Should I try again? Okay. So thanks again. And I do hope to visit in person in the near future. This is a, this talk is based on a paper that's actually posted uh, to the archive today. This is uh, my outstanding collaborator, uh, Gabriel Cuomo. And this talk is about, this talk is about semi-classical limits that arise in uh, many body quantum systems, quantum field theory and condensed matter, many body systems uh, in the limit of large quantum numbers. So just a historical remark. I'll begin with this uh, small historical remark. Also, please just stop me at any point if something I, that I said should be clarified or if you have comments. So historically, of course, um, people have become interested at, in non-trivial fixed points of the renormalization group in the context of condensed matter, high energy physics, or more generally quantum field theory a, a long time ago because of the connection to second order phase transitions and zero temperature phase transitions later. So this is a very old subject. And one of the biggest uh, problems that people have outlined was the computation of the critical exponents. So people have understood many decades ago that one piece of an interesting information about fixed points of the renormalization group is that we have a bunch of local operators with uh, various scaling dimensions, delta, spin j, and some operator product expansion coefficients. And these are easily accessible experimentally, at least for some low-lying operators. And this characterizes the response that we see in the, uh, the response that we see to external fields, magnetic field, external temperature, and so on. So this data is very interesting still to understand. Now, one thing that is newer is that it, it has been shown already a decade, over a decade ago, that just imposing the associativity of the operator product expansion is quite powerful, at least numerically. It's quite a powerful technique to learn something about this data, namely the scaling dimensions and OPE coefficients. And I'm sure people have heard many seminars about what is the utility of this technique. But actually, this technique is mostly useful for the light operators which are of course also the experimentally most easily accessible ones at a critical point corresponding to uh, small perturbations or external fields that are easily accessible in the lab. So this is one uh, aspect of the subject that I'm not going to talk about. I'm going to talk about a parallel development uh, which is more analytic in nature, less, appeal, less numerical. And this is uh, the study of heavy operators. When I say heavy operators, I mean operators with some large uh, scaling dimension. And there are many aspects of this uh, problem of understanding operators of heavy uh, operators with large scaling dimension. So one aspect of this problem is to, let's say, fix the charge Q under some U1 symmetry and fix the spin J 
and try to ask what is the lowest lying operator with the given Q and J. From the st state operator correspondence, the search for such an operator that would be the lightest operator was given Q and J is equivalent to looking for, to finding a state uh, in the Hilbert space language on the D minus one dimensional sphere, which is the minimum energy state with the given charge and spin. So it's really the search, it's really just the problem of searching for ground states with large quantum numbers. <coughs> so because of this connection to finding ground states with large quantum numbers, uh, uh, of course, techniques from condensed matter theory and from effective field theory are very important to shed some light uh, on operators with large scaling dimension. They correspond to some states and you can try to hope, you can hope to say something about those states. So uh, I'm going to start by reviewing uh, the, what happens when the spin is very large. So you can ask what are the minimal operators with very large spin. These are the references that discuss this problem. Then I'm going to review quickly what happens at large charge, which kind of states do you get? Uh, this there is also a parallel subject where you just try to understand heavy operators, which are not necessarily the minimal operators with some given quantum numbers, but just some generic heavy operators. This is the subject of ETH and hydrodynamics. Uh, there are papers about it here, some of them. Uh, I'm not going to talk about it here. Here, I'm just going to try to talk about the ground states uh, of the system at large quantum numbers and show you what is the present state of the art. So this is the plan for today. I'll first talk about the ground states at large spin. So this is conformal field theory on the D minus one dimensional sphere. You introduce some spin and you ask what's the ground state. Then we'll talk about large Q and then I'll talk about, I'll introduce a new phase, the giant vortex phase. I'll try to talk about, it's a very strange phase with interesting fluctuations and it solves some problem that uh, you will see arises uh, using the conventional techniques. Are there any questions about the introduction? Uh, I have a question, maybe it will get answered later, which is, I, I kind of wonder if you could give some intuition as to why there will be these nice effective field theories in general in these kind of limits that you're studying. I mean. If you just took a quantum mechanics problem uh, with, say, some global symmetry and looked at a large charge sector of that, you might not expect anything nice to happen, any good organizing principle. Right. Uh, but somehow, somehow there's something better that happens in QFT. And I wonder if you could give us some intuition about why, why we would expect that. Yeah, so I can give you some intuition. Uh, so if you consider states on this space, uh, D minus one dimensional sphere. Let's say that the D minus one dimensional sphere has radius R. So of course we know from conformal field theory that, typic that uh, the typical energy scale is one over R just because there isn't any other scale. Uh, when you have a very large quantum number such as Q or J, let's say Q, you expect that the underlying that the low lying states will have a constant charge density and the charge density will define a new scale which is basically by dimensional analysis a uh, square root of q uh, over r why is that true because the charge density is q over r squared let's say in two plus one dimensions let's say that you're in two plus one dimensions uh, the charge density is q over r squared and therefore there is now a new emergent scale which is square root of q over r and similarly, you can make some arguments for the angular momentum. So now we have a system with a new scale, which is square root of Q over R. And you can imagine that if Q is very large, there will be physics below that scale that could be captured by effective field theory. I don't know if this is a palatable answer, but it is what's happening in examples. But the large quantum numbers provide a new scale below which you can integrate out stuff and get them simplified description. Mm -hmm. I don't know if this is a complete answer, of course. No. Okay, that, that was helpful. Thank you. 
So let's let me start with a very uh, cool problem, uh, which by now has become experimentally and also verified in Monte Carlo. So you can ask, what are the lightest operators of some given spin J? So you can think about it either in terms of local operators, or you can think about it as a state on the sphere, which is rotating very fast. So the, the point, so the main idea here is that take any local operator, which is uh, some any local operator in the in the CFT, and study the operator product of this operator with itself, let's say. So of course, the right hand side has typically infinitely many primary operators, and you can't say much about them. But there is a very special class of operators that appear on the right hand side, which you can loosely speaking. Uh, denote using this, you denote as phi j derivatives and another phi. And these j derivatives are symmetrized. So you have spin j. Now, of course, it's kind of a very, a slightly ambiguous notation perhaps, but this is how it's used in the literature. There is such a trajectory of operators in the right-hand side of the OP. And these are the lightest operators with spin j. And their claim to fame is that their scaling dimensions behave as if they're free fields, almost as if they're free fields. So there is J from the scaling dimension of the derivative, and there is two times the dimension of phi. And then there are small corrections uh, suppressed by some power, which is uh, dependent on the specific model that you study, but it's a non-zero power of J. So up to some power corrections in J, these operators behave almost as free fields. And they're called regi trajectories, just because it's reminiscent of the regi trajectories in particle physics. Delta goes like J. Okay. Now, this is the existence of these operators. And the fact that they are suppressed by a power of J uh, has been uh, shown uh, analytically and also by now seen in Monte Carlo, at least for the first few operators. And um, various other techniques show the same thing. Okay, so these are the ground states with some given spin j. So this is a numerical demonstration. This is the O2 model, the XY model in condensed matter language in two plus one dimensions. It's the Wilson-Fisher fixed point. Here I denote, I used, I took a plot from Liu, Meltzer, Poland, and Simmons Duffin. So their spin is not j, it's L. And tau is delta minus j. So to make the plot nice, they take delta minus j. So the j goes to the left hand side and you call it tau. So then you expect a function that just asymptotes to twice the scaling dimension of phi. And that's exactly what you find. You see, there, these are several regi trajectories. So there is the zero plus, zero minus, and two regi trajectories. And they all asymptote to the same place with the powers, with some power suppression, one over j, exactly matching the analytic prediction. And it's all the way up to spin 20 at this point. And I think by now people have spin 50 in some other examples. So this is a correct, uh, this is a, basically the correct picture for the ground states at large angular momentum. They consist of almost free field. Um, and uh, well, one way you can think about it is as you can think about this as partons. So you can think about phi as a parton and the other phi is another parton, and they're just chasing around on the sphere, like in this picture. Basically, these are well-separated particles that are chasing each other, and they experience pretty weak interactions. And this is independent of the underlying field theory. So even if the underlying field theory is strongly coupled, uh, this is still true, that in the large spin limit, everything becomes kind of free. So this is the simplification at large spin, okay? So actually these plots, even though these predictions are, of course, there's some power series in one over J. If you actually try to fit these plots, it, it works very well all the way to small spin. This is the usual exceptional success of effective field theory that you get very nice predictions all the way to small quantum numbers. Now in the O2 model, the minimal value that tau mean that appeared in the previous formula, let me remind you, the tau mean that appeared here, is actually just one, and that's in also in these plots. <coughs> this is the generic statement. Now let me make a comment about what would be the case 
if we took very large angular momentum, but some non-zero charge Q, let's say Q equals 10 or Q equals 15, where Q is the, old, is the U1 charge of these operators. So then the structure of the partons, then the structure of the operators would be very similar to what we had before, but there would be now Q partons. So there will be Q partons that will be chasing each other on the sphere, experiencing some very small interactions. And we have to split the derivatives in such a way that the sum of all these derivatives is exactly J. Okay, so these are, these are the ground states at some fixed small Q, let's say Q equals 10 or Q equals 20. And when J is the largest parameter in the problem, you just have partons facing each other and uh, there is some sort of huge, there is some sort of huge heterosy in this result, because you see the scaling dimension of these operators is gonna be just J plus Q times the dimension of a single parton. And then we have a small correction, uh, which goes like Q squared over J. Just a second. I'm stopping for a second for questions, but there is some kind of background noise. I have to figure out where is it coming from. It's annoying me a lot. Oh. Is it still going on now? Yeah, it's a little bit less than it was at the beginning, but it's just make it, it makes it a little bit hard to concentrate. Okay. So let me just make this point and then I'll stop for questions. If you have some non-zero total charge Q, there are, there are Q partons and you have to spread out J derivatives. And therefore there is some sort of degeneracy because you can move derivatives from place to place to leading order that doesn't change the answer. This is the scaling dimension to leading order. So the corrections go like Q squared over J. And that's the most important thing that I wanted to say first. So we see that the large spin expansion actually breaks down when J becomes of order Q squared. There is an infinite series of corrections that becomes important. And you have to resum them. You have to resum them to say something sensible. Is and this uh, degeneracy organized by some emergent symmetry that exists in that limit? Uh, I, I don't know. It's, it's basically, well, technically the statement is clear why there is a degeneracy, right? It's just that the scaling dimension to leading order is only sensitive to the sum of the A's and to the fact that there are Q partons. And there are small corrections. So this leads to a huge, huge degeneracy. Uh, I don't know if there is a symmetry reason, but it's approximate. It's not an exact degeneracy. Some corrections here would lift this degeneracy eventually. Yeah, Actually, I was just wondering if, there, if the degenerate states are the multiplet of some big group. I don't know what is the answer to that. Um, but also the leading effects that leave the degeneracy were not yet computed, I should say. So here you are, you have tau min equal to one in the yes. mm -hmm. that is only for O2 model or it's uh, for uh, it's, it's always it's always because the lowest tau min is the power that appears in the effective field theory here. Mm -hmm. And in all the models, it would be basically one because of the energy momentum tensor. So this is like the minimal operator you can exchange. Mm -hmm. Via this, these small Yukawa exchanges are due to the exchange of light operators. And there is always the energy momentum tensor that has tau min equals one. Mm -hmm. So it can be one or smaller, but in the O2 model, there isn't an operator for which this is smaller. So you just get one. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we see that once you introduce some global charge Q, we have this nice picture of Q partons moving on the equator. And uh, we see that this description breaks down when this perturbative sum in Q squared over J uh, needs to be resummed in some way. Okay. Okay. Are there any questions about the fact that we see that large spin effective theory or regit theory, this is, this is sometimes called regit theory or large spin effective theory. We see that this description of the ground states breaks down 
when the spin is uh, not large enough. It's of order Q squared. Okay. So you this point, order Q squared, then uh, why um, this, the second and the third term are still small compared to the first term? Or how, how do you see that? How do you see the breakdown? Okay. So when J becomes of order Q squared, you see, this is not an exact formula. There is a power series expansion here. And one has to resum the power series expansion. It's just that the, that the expansion, it's true that uh, the expansion is now in a parameter, which is order one, but we don't just don't know what it resums to. We don't know what this resums to. It may or may not be I mean, you should, so physically you have three particles. This describes three particles, right? J plus two delta phi is just the answer for three particles that don't exchange any interactions. And now you have an interaction that becomes order one. So it is true that it's not competitive with the rest mass, so to speak. This is just the free particle answer. It's not competitive with the rest mass, but this is an interaction of order one. So it's like in quantum mechanics that you have a huge rest mass but if you have an interaction of order one, you can get a completely different ground state. Like think about many, many bosons with each with very large mass, but still they have some interaction. You can get a new, you can get a completely different ground state. So we just have to resume this interaction. This was never done. Uh, okay, so this effective field theory breaks down at some point, but it's useful when J is much bigger than Q squared. So let me just tell you what is this interaction? What is this interaction? Where is it coming from? So this interaction is coming from the exchange of some light particles. You can think about it if you like ADS CFT. You can think about it in an ADS language as the exchange of gravitational force, the gra as, as gravitational forces and electrical forces. So there, this is the gravitational force, which is attractive. This is the, these two dashed lines are like the partons. So the dashed lines are the partons and the wiggly line is gravity. And this wiggly line is electromagnetism. So because these partons have the same charge, let's say Q equals one, electri electri the electromagnetic interaction is repulsive and gravity is attractive. You have to compute and we compute it in the O2 model. It comes out negative. So the interaction is attractive. So one might expect from just the you know, condensed matter theory of particles with large attractive interactions that maybe this collapses to some kind of Bose-Einstein condensate. This uh, picture collapses to some new effective field theory of a Bose-Einstein condensate. I don't know if it's always true that gravity wins. Uh, so gravity is not the weakest force here. Unlike the weak gravity conjecture, it's actually a larger force than the repulsion. But anyway, I do not know if gravity always wins. It is certainly the dominant force in the O2 model by uh, a small, by, well, numerically, it's just this diagram is bigger than this diagram numerically. Okay. So one of the main points of this talk would be to make a proposal for what happens when J is smaller than Q squared. So, <clears throat> We see that if we start from very large spin and go towards Q squared, we need the new state. But it's very hard to guess at this point what kind of effective filter we need. So to get more hints, it's useful to start now to, discuss, to review the subject of large Q with very small J and increase J. So then we can like sort of narrow down what is the domain where there is a puzzle and come up with the conjecture of what might be the resolution. So now I'm going to forget about J. Now Q will be large and we'll start cranking up J. So <clears throat> this is what I told uh, Clay, I think at the beginning, you do expect when Q is very large and J is very, and let's say J is order one, that there is some condensed matter state with non-zero charge density on the sphere that defines a new cutoff a new high energy scale. So of course we cannot prove what is the ground state, but we can, we know what we can expect. We can expect a broken a phase with a broken new one, that would be a superfluid, or we can expect a Fermi surface. 
And this is now filtery dependent. Some filters are known to lead, to lead to a Fermi surface. Some filters lead to a broken U1. In particular, the O2 model and many other models seem to lead to an, a superfluid phase quite generically. Of course, also a Fermi surface phase is unstable towards uh, BCS. So maybe this phase is much more generic in the space of possible answers. Is the supersymmetric possibility is not one of these, right? It's some something yet. Yeah, I'm not. I'm, yeah, I'm not assuming. I'm not talking about supersymmetric theories. If you are, if you have a supersymmetric theory, then um, well, you have to supersymmetrize those two phases, and um, the story will be completely different. We didn't think about the supersymmetric story. But in in general, I mean, is the can we have many different possible phases beyond those that we just that we just listed? We just listed a few, but yeah, there could be many, many. I mean, you're basically asking what could be the ground states at non-zero charge density, or more. Let me just put it more bluntly: you're basically taking a zero temperature critical point, and you're introducing chemical potential for the for for the particle density. So nobody knows what's this, you know, full list of possible phases that you can encounter. There are probably many possibilities that we don't even know about. But does it have to be weakly coupled? Well, by definition, you are just capturing states that are below mu. Uh, but it doesn't, and surely it doesn't have to be weakly coupled. There could be Fermi surfaces coupled to some interacting bosons and God knows what are the possibilities. But if you look at examples, and it seems that uh, this superfluid phase is very generic. In non-supersymmetric theories. Yes, that's right. This is the answer in the XY model. This is the answer in the particle in, in, in gauge theories like NAIL VBS. Yeah, this seems to be a very generic answer. So I'm going to now uh, try to attack the problem from the other direction of assuming that this is the answer at large Q and small j, and then try to connect the puzzle. Would you explain how you know that uh, numerically that O2 goes to the superfluid phase? Oh, this uh, I will show you that this generates predictions, and they have been confirmed to an, to a very remarkable uh, precision. So once you make an assumption, it leads to predictions for the scaling dimensions, right? That's where we began. And then you can try to check the scaling dimensions in Monte Carlo and see if it works. Okay. Or of course you can try to do epsilon expansion and large N and it leads to a consistent picture. But we don't know it from first principles. We, now, we just know that making this assumption leads to uh, things in agreement with Monte Carlo and experiment, and it's in agreement with the epsilon expansion and large gen. Zohar, can, can I ask in, um, this discussion of all these different phases for the large charge? I mean, is there an analogous discussion that could have taken place for large J? Are there different phases that one could contemplate there? Um, it turns out that no. It turns out that no. We and that we, we somehow were able in this context to prove that this is always the answer, that you always get free fields with small corrections. I see. So here there is no room for wiggle. No, there is no wiggle room. It's just, this seems to be always the answer. Uh, uh, in this case, of course, this is not always the answer. I do know of quantum filters that lead to a Fermi surface, a large charge. For instance, just free fermion theory. But I think as soon as you put interactions, generically, you just get a superfluid. I'm not sure why, but that seems to be the answer in examples. I can give you many examples of that sort later. Yeah. Thank you. So what is this phase? Uh, it's, it's a conformal superfluid. So it's a relativistic, relativistic conformal superfluid, where as usual in superfluid theory, time translations is mangled with the charge and you have a Goldstone mode, which you expand around a background like this with small fluctuations. And this is the cutoff that I mentioned several times already. This is the ground state. It's small j or zero j. So this is the Lagrangian. The full superfluid mode has a bizarre Lagrangian, which is non-local. It's cubic. 
but we don't use it, of course. We only use it in an expansion around this background because we want to preserve the diagonal of this symmetry. And then there is a host of corrections which are down by the cutoff scale. So it's like any effective filter, there are corrections. And in this uh, very nice paper, seminal paper, they use this effective filter to compute the prediction for the scaling dimensions. So the scaling dimensions have an unknown Wilson coefficient coming from the first term times Q to the three halves, some new unknown Wilson coefficient coming from the second term and the third term, and a completely universal order one coefficient that is computable. It is independent of Wilson coefficients. Okay, so you get a very concrete prediction for the scaling dimension as a function of Q, which is valid at very large Q, maybe Q equals 100. And then you can go and compare it to, to simulations and people see this exact structure. So this seems to be the right answer. Now, the small fluctuations around this, this is the ground state, okay? This is just the ground state, pi equals to zero, and this is the ground state. Now we can ask, what are the small fluctuations? The small fluctuations are just the sound modes, yeah? So we have small fluctuations with this dispersion relation. You see the half? So that means that the fluctuations are moving with the speed of sound one over square root of two, not at the speed of light, because this is a state of matter with non-zero density uh, and pressure. So, so we have uh, one over square root of two speed of sound. These are the fluctuations. Now you can start building angular momentum. You can start from your superfluid and add a few phonons like this. This is like a free Fox space. And you can identify some of the phonons with the descendants of the conformal algebra. They are guaranteed to exist and have scaling dimension one. So actually the, this, these are just the A1 modes. If you plug J equals one, you will see that omega squared becomes exactly uh, one over R. And that's exactly the dimension of the derivative. So this, the ordinary descendants are included nicely in this uh, modes. And anyway, this gives you a Fox space of phonons. But the phonons cannot take you very far. This is the formula that you get from the phonons. You start adding a little bit of angular momentum to the superfluid. But this cannot take you very far. You're limited by square root of Q because square root of U is the effective filter cutoff. So you cannot really trust phonons when they become, uh, when the wavelength is much smaller than the cutoff. So how do we go beyond that? That seems like a very uh, sad ending point for this effective filtering. We know from ages ago that superfluid, when it's spinning, it likes to develop vortices. So in this very nice paper of Cuomo and his collaborators, they amended the superfluid description to contain vortices. And famously, the vortices form some very nice lattice. So what are vortices in superfluid theory? They are essentially in the non-relativistic limit, the same as charged particles moving in a magnetic field. So if you want to describe vortices moving in this isotropic superfluid, you just think about them as if they're charged particle moving in a constant magnetic field, which is properly quantized. And because of the angular momentum in the charge monopole system, the vortices acquire angular momentum, which is pointing exactly in the direction where they are on the two sphere. So if you have a vortex in some direction on the two sphere, you have angular momentum pointing in that direction classically. So the next ground state that these people came up with was just a vortex anti-vortex pair. That allows you to increase the angular momentum compared to what you get from just phonons. And you get this very nice prediction for the scaling dimension, which is valid in this domain up to Q, when J is up to Q. So here, there is only one unknown coefficient alpha. So the, this logarithmic correction is completely universal. It's the same Wilson coefficient that appeared in the leading term. So it's already known in the O2 model. So we exactly know what is the coefficient of this object. Are there any questions about this vortex anti-vortex configuration? So the vortex, anti-vortex, these vortices from the point of view of the effective filter are what again? Can you say them again? Um, so when you talk about phonons, you're basically quantizing this free theory. Yeah. You're expanding in spherical harmonics. Yeah. Spherical harmonics are single valued functions on the sphere. But pi is a compact scalar because it uh, originated from a comp from a U1 Goldstone boson. So pi is a compact scalar. So there's and like a sorter operator. 
So you can, yeah, you can think about configurations where pi winds around the specific point. Those would not be describable with spherical harmonics because uh, they are not single valued. So pi goes to pi plus two pi. So yeah, well, it's, <laughs> this fluctuation goes to itself plus two pi. Yeah, this fluctuation goes to itself plus two pi when you go around when you go around the vortex. Okay. But why is the energy of that configuration computable? It's not. The energy of this configuration is not computable. You can if, if, there there are even filters where the energy could be infinite. And I but in the O2 model, in the O2 model, it should exist and it should be finite. All we have assumed if the, is that this energy of this configuration is finite. And then this logarithmic term comes out with a universal coefficient. And you but cannot- Isn't that the energy of the configuration? Isn't there an unknown additive shift from the vortex? Very good. So this is the energy due to the fact that there is a vortex anti-vortex pair. In addition, this formula has a correction, which is parametrically smaller because of what you said, that each vortex has an unknown mass. And but actually it works out- hmm? Wouldn't it be infinite? No, it's not infinite. Because we're not, you know, it's finite. Uh, it's we, it's it's finite in the O2 model. I, if you had the theory with a one-form symmetry, it could be infinite. I see. But in the O2 model, we definitely expect that there are finite energy vortices, and by dimensional analysis, their mass has to be proportional to square root of q. So there is some unknown Wilson coefficient with that you have to add to this formula that goes like square root of q. But it's not going to be competitive with the j squared over q because we're in this range. So this term is actually parametrically bigger than the unknown contribution from the rest mass of the vortices. But you're completely correct that if a theory has a one-form symmetry, it could be that the vortices will actually have infinite mass and they don't exist. But we just assume that their mass is given by square root of q up to an unknown coefficient that needs to be found from the epsilon expansion or the Rgn or whatever, or experiment. Okay. So, I see. You're, you're just saying that the the, peri the the symmetry coming from the, the fact that you have a periodic scalar must be broken in the in the full theory. Yeah, by, exactly. by finite mass fluctuations. By finite yeah, mass fluctuations. Exactly. At the core of the vortex, the condensate goes to zero. Yeah. At the core of the vortex, and you should expect that this that in this theory, since there is no fundamental there is no fundamental one for symmetry. Mm -hmm. only an emergent one form symmetry you should expect that this configuration has finite mass and by dimensional analysis the only mass that it can have is square root of q which is the only scale in the problem okay. now to actually measure this mass is an open question you can try to compute it in the epsilon expansion or large n but it's not known what it is either way this formula would stay correct because this is parametrically bigger than that effect okay Okay, you can push it a little bit further. Remember that if I remind you the simulations, at the beginning you have one vortex or maybe two vortices, but at the end you have some sort of very nice uh, body with many, many vortices. So there is such a solution. Uh, it's a rotating bunch of vortices on the two sphere, which we call the rigid body. Actually, it's described in one of Feynman's lectures. And this allows you to push to Q to the three halves. It's just a rotating rigid body of vortices. And presumably when J becomes Q to the three halves, the rotation exceeds the supersonic limit. So they rotate faster than the speed of sound and this should lead to an instability. So let me just summarize where we are. We have seen that rigid theory of partons, which is very different from superfluid theory. It's completely different characters and completely different rules breaks down at Q squared. And on the other hand, we, we have a superfluid theory that covers the regime up to Q to the three halves. And up to, the Q, 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 up to this Q to the three halves, you can have this rigid body of vortices that rotates uh, at, uh, at relativistic speeds. And so there is a missing domain between Q to the power three halves and Q squared. And it should somehow magically interpolate between the vortices or the superfluid theory and rigid theory, which is a very different description. Also, remember that in rigid theory, we had this infinite degeneracy and there is no sign of such a thing in this uh, structure. So there is some puzzle. And what I wanted to tell you about today is how to fill that puzzle. So there is a new phase 
which magically interpolates between the two and has very peculiar fluctuations. And also it was very recently seen in experiment, which is why we started working on the subject. So recently people that work on Bose-Einstein condensates in a trap found that when the angular moment, uh, velocity increases, so you keep increasing J, they found that this lattice of vortices that was known from before, this was the last phase that was seen before, this lattice of vortices or the rigid body of vortices. Now they found a new phase that they called the giant vortex. It's basically a huge vortex rotating very fast and it's pushing away the superfluid, so there is nothing inside. And there are many, uh, there is a theory, there is some theory treatment of these, there are experiments. This is a real picture, by the way. It's been seen experimentally last two years ago. So we start, and in as far as the theory goes, not much is known about this phase. What are the fluctuations? What are the energy scales? So we decided to see if this, something like this can fit into the picture of uh, the O2 model or some similar models in two plus one dimensions. So, wait, sorry. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not quite understanding what's being plotted here. What are okay. the different color code? Okay. Yeah, so this, so maybe I'll get to the O2, the, in the O2 model, you'll see the solution explicitly. Okay. Would that be okay? Yeah. Yeah. So this would be a summary of the talk. I just have to explain to you what is the giant vortex. So we have regit theory, we have the giant vortex, and then we have the superfluid phase, which covers these three domains, the vortices, the rigid body, and then we have the giant vortex and the diagram seems to be complete as you'll see. So what is this giant vortex? This is our version of the giant vortex. Instead of expanding around mu t, we now expand around mu t minus L phi where L is some large integer. Imagine a hundred, this is the angular momentum. So now, unlike before, the superfluid is not spreading through the whole two sphere. The superfluid is localized in some in some little strip. Uh, well, this, it's localized in a strip that's much bigger than the cutoff of the theory, but it could be smaller than the whole sphere. And you have you can explicitly compute the charge density and the size of the strip, and you find the cut. You can find the cutoff. You can do all the computations that you want with this configuration, and it solves the equations of motion. That is our main observation. There is this new solution to the equations of motion where the superfluid lives in a strip and it's rotating. So let me just uh, uh, explain a little bit more detail what's going on. So in the blue domain, it seems completely gapped. There is no superfluid. Uh, there are no low lying modes. There is no effective filter to talk about. In the red zone, there is a superfluid. And then there's a small green zone where this is the boundary between the superfluid and the empty phase. And we didn't finish analyzing this boundary theory. It's not important at leading order, but it introduces some leading order corrections to many, many things, the effects of this boundary layer. Okay, uh, so this is roughly speaking the configuration. Are there any questions about it? Now I'll tell you about the excitations of this configuration. Sorry, what, and what governs the um, the uh, profile in the polar direction? Uh, we found the solution of the equations of motion. This turns out to be a solution, this simple thing. And this gives you the charge density in the polar direction. And it's such that it has to be cut off at some point. So you cannot continue this configuration throughout the sphere. It's only near the equator in some strip. And the size of the strip depends on the angular momentum. So physically, if the angular momentum is around Q to the three halves, it's not narrow. When you increase the spin, it becomes narrower and narrower. And amazingly enough, exactly when you hit Q squared, the size of the strip becomes of the order of the cutoff and this effective filter loses its meaning. So this giant vortex fits like a gem exactly where we needed it. It makes sense above Q to the three halves and below Q squared. At Q squared, it becomes too narrow for effective filter to make sense. 
and at two to the three halves, we just go back to the rigid body. Okay. So this is exactly the regime where this makes sense. It's a legitimate solution and you can study its fluctuations. Just, I'll just quote for a second. This is, so the first amazing hint that this is the right answer comes from computing the scaling dimension or the energy of this uh, giant vortex. And so to leading order within this domain, this is the answer, it's just J. And this has exactly coefficient one. It's computable and it's independent of Wilson coefficients. Even though the action had Wilson coefficients all over the place, this is completely independent of the Wilson coefficients. So we found exactly the same slope that we know is true in the Regger regime. Furthermore, this term becomes of order Q when you approach the boundary of the domain of validity of the giant vortex. We did, as I said, we did not work out the boundary layer theory, but this boundary layer theory would have to be responsible for various corrections here that we have not worked out. So one of the most- Can you explain mechanically how it comes out that the leading term is independent of Wilson coefficients? Like uh, it's because, yeah, it's because the formula for the angular momentum and the formula for delta are both exactly linear in the Wilson coefficient alpha. I see. So the spectrum of fluctuations that we worked out, I think is also relevant for these experiments. Um, I think it should be the same answer. Uh, so what I'm saying now should apply also for these uh, configurations that they found in experiments. So actually the spectrum of fluctuations, oh, I forgot to put one over R. It should be one over R times M plus N. So there are two integers, M and N, M is any integer, N is a positive integer. And the energy is M plus N and the angular momentum is Q plus M. So first of all, you see that this is a chiral theory. So the spectrum of fluctuations is a bunch of chiral modes. Excitations that are moving clockwise and increase the angular momentum have positive M and they also increase the energy. But excitations that are moving the other way decrease the energy. Furthermore, the speed of sound is the speed of light. So it's very different from what we saw before. Before, the speed of light, sound was one over square root of two of the speed of light, and the excitations were non chiral. Now we have chiral excitations that are moving at the speed of light, and we see an infinite, infinite degeneracy because m is any integer. So if you take any combination of states in the Fox space for which the sum over M vanishes, it's exactly the generate the ground state. And furthermore, the parameter N can be interpreted as the daughter trajectory that we saw before. So N corresponds to some way of contracting derivatives that increases the register, that increases the, uh, increases the energy and leads to, regi to daughter register trajectories. So this spectrum of fluctuations is essentially isomorphic to the spectrum of operators of this sort. It has infinite degeneracy and it has regular trajectories, daughter and leading regular trajectories. And there are small effects due to the boundary layer and due to higher derivative corrections that lift the infinite degeneracy. But these effects are very small in this domain between Q to three halves and Q squared. They are parametrically small. So it's a strange chiral theory because the spectrum of energies is labeled by an integer. This is not like the compact boson in 2D or the chiral boson where M is non-negative. Here M is any integer. So you have an infinite degeneracy. So the spectrum of fluctuation seems to just match on the nose what we wanted. I'll now, let me just mention some open questions. Of course, you can try to generalize this analysis to four dimensions, to supersymmetric theories, to parity validating CFTs on which Luca and others worked on. Uh, another open question is what happens to this rigid body and around the supersonic regime? How does the so rigid body become unstable? Of course, here I presented a bunch of phases. But nobody proved that those are all the phases. And furthermore, it's basically unknown what are the orders of the transitions. For instance, what is the order of the transition from this to this to this? It's all unknown. 
that would be nice to figure out what are the orders of these transitions and what is their nature. Another concrete question is to resum these corrections when j goes to q squared from the large spin expansion. We saw that this is dominated by the exchange of the energy momentum tensor. And this basically is the problem of thinking about these partons and how they collapse to the giant vortex. So just going back to that story, let me finish with that comment. We saw this picture of partons that have small interactions, small attractive, attractive interactions. They should somehow collapse to the giant vortex at j equals q squared. So that would be nice to see. It might be possible to do it analytically by resumming these terms. Um, also, it's important that it was attractive. If the interaction between the partons was repulsive, it would be very unlikely to get the Bose-Einstein condensate. You might end up with a quantum whole state, not the Bose-Einstein condensate. So, okay, this more or less finishes the comments that I wanted to make. Thank you. Are there any more questions I'm happy to answer? Could you tell a bit us a uh, bit more about how the speed of sound discontinuously changes across the transition? It was half the speed on the one side, right, on the vortex. Right? Yeah, I, I uh, I, I, I don't really. So what? So you have a rigid body, which becomes supersonic, right? And it has super, it has speed of sound one over square root of two. But when it becomes supersonic, you have an instability, like Cherenkov radiation or something like super radiant instability. Sometimes people call it super radiant instability. So presumably, that instability means that you have to go to a completely new phase. It could be even first order. I don't know if it's first order or, or second order, but you could go to a new phase, which has completely different characteristics. So for me, this is not an, I don't see a contradiction because it's often the case that when you have super radiant instability, you settle in a completely different new ground state. Actually, the equations are all known. It's just a matter of analyzing them and showing how this happens. The equations are all in our paper. We just weren't able to determine the answer yet. It's classical differential equations that you have to solve. They're even algebraic in this case, I believe. Yeah. Any more questions I can try to answer? Phase plot. So, so are there analogous uh, results for when the symmetry, the internal symmetry is not abelian? Like what's the phase portrait there? Um, yeah, if there are, Maybe a little bit is known about the O4 model. A tiny bit is known, but yeah, not 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 nearly as much as about this case, where there is only a U1 U1. Not nearly as much, yeah. So, so in the in, in the situation where this superfluid phase is potentially coming from like a pairing instability of a Fermi surface. Um, is it possible to have like a more sort of uh, more intricate phase diagram with completing superfluid orders or? Yeah, one, one question that uh, we discussed but have not made progress on is suppose there are, this is the right answer. Mm -hmm. The regit theory is still applicable. Mm -hmm. The regit theory is still always correct and it has the exact same form as what I said. Right. But what would be the phases of a Fermi surface when you start spinning it? Right, right, right. Yeah, even if they, there is no instability, as you said, suppose they, there is no instability to forming a superfluid, I guess. That's what you said. What would be the phase diagram then? I don't know. And actually, there are, there are field theories that realize this uh, possibility. So for instance, if you take a boson with fractional, like U1 level K charge boson. Right. This is a, as you know, with Q much smaller than Q, K squared. It's known that this is the right answer, but right. the phase diagram is not known, and it's not known how do you connect to the partons in the red theory. I see, I see, I see. 
I, I, I meant even when there is a there is a super conduct uh, super fluid instability, like you can still have different competing orders, like an S wave super fluid versus a P oh, wave yeah. super fluid, or no, of course I understand. I yeah. understand. I, I I don't know the answer. We have not looked at it, but uh, yeah, we haven't looked at it. I can say another. There is another puzzle. There is another puzzle that uh, has is probably unrelated, but let me just still mention it. If you look at the giant vortex solution, it allows you to only cover values of the angular momentum, which are integer multiples of Q. Mm -hmm. Now, this is not, it doesn't sound like a big deal because J is much, much bigger than Q to the three halves. Mm -hmm. But still, you cannot really use the phonons of the giant vortex to cover all the possible Js because it doesn't make sense in effective field theory. Right. So there is something, uh, yeah, this thing is not clearly understood at the moment. Yeah. Because of this um, boundary layer where you have to somehow know how the phonon behaves when it approaches this boundary layer, how, what is the, uh, um, the obstacle to use effective field theory just inside the strip? Um, uh, the effective filtery cutoff inside the strip is uh, is what's written here. It's the uh, square root of Q, you see? So you can try to imagine a so phonon excitations on top of the giant vortex, but you cannot really allow for phonons, which would increase the energy by Q. That wouldn't make sense. So, okay. Yeah, and the boundary layer is somewhat an in, a different story. This kind of physics of a boundary layer appeared recently in several applications. It's when you have an effective filter with a cutoff, but the cutoff goes to zero near the boundary. This happens when you study mesons, open strings, which are spinning fast, or when you study the whole droplet in some uh, applications in condensed matter the cutoff goes to zero at the boundary. So the question is, how do you describe a boundary condition if the cutoff of the effective filter goes to zero? And people invented some technique, which is called the boundary layer, it was invented here by Meze, Raviv Moshe, and Cuomo. Well, you kind of smear the boundary a little bit and push it in. And it turns out that if you do it, you always get Neumann boundary conditions. So we use this description to make sure that our predictions to the order are completely correct and the corrections are suppressed and that this is completely correct the leading order notice also that fluctuations don't have any wilson coefficients so the fluctuations really match those of the rigid theory and there are no unknown wilson coefficients so this potentially also leads to a prediction for what happens in superfluid theory like in the Bose-Einstein condensate, if they keep it keep spinning it a little bit more fast, it should break down into partons, exactly like what we see in our case. So the next phase should be a bunch of partons that are trailing each other. So the transition between the two regimes would be some transition in a one dimension, one plus yeah. one B theory. Yes, exactly. And that's exactly why we were lucky. I mean, that's exactly why it can become supersonic. Somebody already asked about this. But it becomes supersonic exactly because the fluctuations move at the speed of light, not at the speed of sound now, which is the same, like the speed of sound becomes the speed of light. So you can use this description beyond the previous values of the angular momentum. But is this theory a free theory in some sense? Is... No, no. It, it has to realize non-linearly the conformal symmetries. So there are interactions. There are small interactions between these fluctuations and small effects that lift the infinite degeneracy. But they're all small in this limit. Mm -hmm. But it's not free, no. It has to obey, uh, it has to obey the symmetries. Mm -hmm.
Okay, any more questions? So. There's no more questions. Let's thank Zohar again. Thank you, Zohar. Thank you, everybody. Um, maybe if you have time, I can ask you about play's question again. So is uh, no supersymmetric in some in many supersymmetric theory the U1 direction is flat. Uh, do we, good people think about what would happen for high charge operator in that case? Since the of the direction is flat and in, in flat space there is no superfluid at finite chemical potential. Of course, yeah, there is no that well, delta goes like Q, right? Yeah. The, the lightest one goes like Q. Yeah, instead of this formula, you'll get Q. Yeah, just get Q. Yeah. Yeah, that's for the BPS. That's for the BPS operators. Right. Those are the lightest ones, though. Um, uh -huh. How about the excitation, etc.? Well, but I don't. I think it's, isn't that the leading the like the effective action for what you call chi? I mean, I think it has a it has like a curvature term instead of having a d chi cubed. Uh -huh. It has like a it has something involving it has something involving a curvature. And, and uh, that term will dominate. Yeah. Well, I think that there is another mode that you cannot throw away, which is the radial mode. Yeah. Well, I, I where you can throw away that mode? I, I somehow thought that it was like like R D chi as the leading term or something like that, like a curvature term and D chi. No, I think there is another mode. You need another mode. But you're talking about the, the super partner of Kai or something else? I'm talking about the super partner of Kai, yes. Yeah. And I also think that it's not known what happens when you increase the angular momentum. I don't think it's known. At zero angular momentum, you have these BPS operators. Mm -hmm. But I don't know what happens when you increase the angular momentum. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's boring. Maybe you just get the descendants, just the descendants of the lowest lying uh, j equals zero operator. That's certainly not what happens here. Here you have a concave function, so the descendants are more energetic than the states that I talked about. I, yeah, I don't know the answer what happens in the Soze theories. I suspect you just get j plus q, something boring like this. No, but it has to have a phase diagram that again goes back to this parton theory. Yeah, but the parton theory would be consistent with J plus Q. Oh, I see. Uh, because you just get this. I think it will be just like J plus Q all over the place throughout the phase diagram. Uh -huh. Sorry, uh, I meant this. I think this will be the answer throughout the phase diagram for BPS operators. <laughs> I'm not, I just know that this has to cancel. These interactions will cancel because they're BPS, so this will just cancel each other. Uh -huh. I think it will be just like, that's for BPS operators. If you look at non-BPS operators, it should be more similar to this story with the superfluid. So, so is there some sort of like parametric separation between these two? No, there's no parametric separation. Like, like one seems to scale like Q to the three halves and the other like Q? I think there is, yeah. Why not clay? I think there is. I think at large, uh, at large Q, you you should you, there should be a parametric separation. Yes, I would suspect there is actually. There is a paper about it by Watanabe and somebody else, where they looked at some conformal manifold and in some limits, they looked at they looked at some BPS operators and some non BPS operators. Collide like the stress tensor with the BPS operator, and uh, can't you just collide some like light, you know, light scalar with the with the BPS operator and get something that's where you've only increased delta by an order one amount, but Q has stayed the same. How can you do that? It might be that it would increase the energy by a huge amount. No? Yeah, I guess. It's possible. I don't know. There is I know I I remember that there is a paper about it by Watanabe. They looked at some question of how the BPS operators I don't remember the setup and I don't remember how much Suzy they had, but they, in the abstract, I remember they said that something, sometimes it's linear, sometimes you get three halves. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.
but so the claim is that there's a huge gap between the BPI. That, that seems interesting. I, I don't know. It's a good question. I frankly don't know. Um, yeah. But I feel I feel this must be the answer. Let me tell you why. I feel that the answer has to be that it has to have a huge gap because we're basically doing something like this, right? We're looking at the minimum of this Hamiltonian. And I feel that if you subtract some combination of charges that is not compatible with the BPS, like you have to subtract something very concrete so that this is compatible with supersymmetry. Right. If you subtract something that's not compatible with supersymmetry, I think you'll get a huge gap compared to the supersymmetric modes. But I might be wrong. I know that in the context of JT gravity, that's not what they say. They say there is a tiny gap above the, above, above the BPS states. But there it's about subtracting a combination that does have a supersymmetric delta function. So actually, okay, so try to define the problem better. What are we doing? Are we subtracting a combination of the U1 charges that is compatible with supersymmetry? Or are we, what are we fixing? Well, I, I think we should fix that. I think if we subtract a combination that is not the R charge with the right multiple, then, uh, th then presumably it's back in the generic story. Yeah, I agree with that completely. Yeah. However, right. if we subtract a combination that includes the R charge with the appropriate coefficient, then the question is like above the BPS states, is there a big gap or are there no. a lot of? I think then no, then no. I don't think actually I take it back. In that case, I think there will be just a phonon that will uh, not be non BPS and you'll get a small gap. Sounds more reasonable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that, that, pho that phonon somehow I, I thought should model like small numbers of t's colliding with the yeah, yeah you i think i i'm now on your side i switched yes if you subtract the combination of chemical potentials which is compatible with bps i think the gap will be order one not small parametrically but order one yeah uh, and if you subtract the combination that's not compatible with Susie, you should get the three halves q to the power three halves yeah okay However, I don't know what's not, suppose you subtract a combination that is compatible with supersymmetry and then you add the angular momentum. I'm not sure that the answer is just J, J plus Q, but it seems like a good guess. Mm -hmm. But you have to try to, when subtracting the angular momentum is not benign, you have to make sure the supersymmetry is preserved. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you could, yeah, you could definitely use that formalism to predict the gap to a non supersymmetric state. It might have been done already in one of these papers of Watanabe. One has to look. Yeah. Sounds reasonable. Can I ask a question? Hmm? Are there, uh, like, um, Einstein Maxwell solutions that do just what you described in ADS? That's a very good question. Um, I think it's a good question. Um, I don't know if there is one paper about the giant vortex in ADS. Okay. I think that somebody wrote an ADS CMT paper after this uh, experimental appearance of the giant vortex. So somebody wrote an ADS CMT paper about this phase in ADS. Uh, you can find the reference in our paper. And I think that's the only paper on the subject at the moment. I see. And is there some critical sort of thing where their solution becomes unstable like yours does at, as you dial J? Uh, I, unfortunately, I don't know. I don't know. But you can find the relevant paper in our reference list. I have another question, which is, is there a way to relate the size of this thing to the alpha in the expression for the delta that you have? The size of the, the, size of the strip is, uh, the size of this strip 
which we denote by uh, little delta is uh, fixed by the ratio of q to the power three halves and j. So for relatively small angular momentum, it's still very wide, which makes sense. And you keep increasing it, you keep increasing the angular momentum, it becomes narrower because of the centrifugal force, just because it pushes away all the superfluid, like in that picture that I had. I had this picture somewhere. Yeah, you see it pushes away, it pushes away the superfluid as you keep spinning it faster. So delta shrinks, and at some point it shrinks so much that this description becomes meaningless, and presumably you get the pythons, like a bunch of pythons rotating around the equator. But delta, the size of the strip is just fixed in terms of this ratio. You can compute it exactly using this formula here. It's in the paper. Any other questions about questions? <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Thanks so much for the hospitality. Sorry you couldn't make it here. Enjoy trick or treating. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, now I can see everybody. <laughs> Good to see you. Bye bye. Thank you.